Well, hey, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I hope you had a good week so far, and I welcome you to our rigging masterclass for today. Uh, I really appreciate the effort uh, with all the bookings and to get into this presentation. Uh, so just to give you a quick introduction of myself, um, I first started in the nuclear industry in 1994 as a nuclear health physicist and uh, then I started with civil engineering and I finished my diploma in 2001 and since I've worked on various projects including Medupi uh, and we I did a North Sea lifting course. So yeah, so hopefully we can work this together. I, I like the concept of the uh, questions and answers session, you'll see there's a there's a place to ask questions and answers and then we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So the idea being that hopefully my presentation will cover a big part of the questions and if it doesn't, we'll go back to you uh, and see what questions you, you, you've got in place for us. So yeah, um, thank you again and uh, that I think that the idea of the masterclass is pretty much what it says. It's a rigging masterclass. So we'll cover all the aspects of rigging, the very basics. So this is not a uh, what a training course as such, but it gives you very good basics as a manager uh, to make sure that you follow the right avenues so that the guys can do safe work. All right, I think let's uh, Let's start with the present. Oh, before we start, I've got a This helmet will be given to the person who answers a trick question. Uh, it's not really a trick question. It's it's a we'll see just now. Um, the value of this helmet is nine hundred and sixty four and seventy four cents excluding that. So if you answer the rigging question correctly by calculating the correct pulley system, you will get this helmet for free. Ha, I think that's pretty cool. So thank you to gear sales. Uh, we will see the, the nice, I'll show you a picture just now of what it looks like. Um, it's a climbing helmet uh, and uh, it's a pretty awesome and comfortable helmet. All right, okay. I think let's start with the slideshow and again, thank you for tuning in. Okay, haha. <laughs> so there's the helmet. How's that? Okay. So again, like I said, it was sponsored by Gravity Gear, and it's a climbing helmet. You'll see uh, it's got all the comfort features. Uh, even it's got even vents in there. So it's a pretty all-around helmet. You can have a look at the specifications on the Gravity Gear website, and they will give you all the bells and whistles about this specific helmet. So now the trick question is what is the question. Ha, that's the question. The question is, name the pulley system in the drawing year. And then it must be done by the end of the slideshow. I recommend that you hold off on giving the answers until the first body break so that you don't um, miss out on any of the discussions we might have. And then at the end of the day, once we have a a winner, we will then post that winner on Facebook before the end of the day. Uh, and yeah, so I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> and I think a, a almost thousand rand helmet is pretty, pretty cool as a, as a gift if you can figure this pulley system out. Please note it's only the main line, so there are no backup lines in this. And you will see a total number of one, two, three pulleys. All right. Good, so let's start with the rigging masterclass. So first of all, I think it's it's important to answer the question, what is rigging and lifting? And uh, in my mind, and I think if you look at the driven machinery regulations as well, it's if you are lifting any load or you are suspending it or you are moving it, then that's considered to be rigging and lifting. 
the additional thing comes in is how you lift it. So in this case, we've got a lifting machine, which is then technically a helicopter. So you can imagine all the, the trick parts that goes into that specific system. But just in simple, rigging and lifting in my mind is a, uh, a load being moved from one point to another or being suspended while something is being done to that load. So yeah, I think it will be interesting to see. Um, maybe it's a good Google question is how do they sling their, their rhino's feet to prevent that uh, there's no blood loss. But anyways, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's something to think about when you get home and, it, and you don't have anything to do during the weekend. So for us um, in the in the industry, I really want to split two different kinds of, of rigging and slinging methods and lifting methods specifically. So on the left hand side, you will see there's a there's a good picture of a, a lifting system with a main and a backup line, but it's mainly done with rope equipment. Uh, the manufacturers all rate these devices and they're all manufactured to a specific EN code, uh, including all the ropes and the carabiners and everything is, is a rated device. And it's been lifted manually by a person's hand. I think you can see there in the picture, there's a Saki's hand is there on the, on the rope and he'll be pulling and a darker gray rope will be my backup device. If something goes pear shape, with the main lift, then ta-da, we have a backup device. On the right-hand side of the picture, you will see there that's that's a mechanical lifting. Typically, again, it will be some sort of device or item or load I need to lift, and it needs to be anchored at the top, and then you've got a lifting machine at the bottom that controls, that actually does the work for you. So we'll... That, that's quite of a nice device we've got there. You'll see it's a capstan winch. Uh, a little bit later about that. Um, the main thing is it, it's controlled by just pulling the rope a little bit and that controls the throttle. So so that's it's a pretty unique device and uh, it's lightweight. It's a, got a petal operated engine. So just to summarize, rope rigging and lifting is using rope equipment, all to EN standards and mechanical lifting is where I use a mechanical device that controls the movement of my load. So just a little bit of, um, I would say, to increase the separation idea a little bit of what is rope lifting and what is mechanical lifting. You will see on the left hand side of the picture the equipment that they use to sling the load with is also again um, rope equipment. There's a carabiner, there's a sling, uh, the rope itself is, is rated for a specific load and it's all got an EN standard for it. But that's, that's all specifically rope equipment. Then when it comes to mechanical equipment, you will see we are using mechanical or the old school lifting tackle. So there's a bow shackle, there's a master link there, um, and the way that we configure it, it works out in a, in a bridle sling. So that's the main two principles. When you're doing rope lifting, you are using rope equipment. And when you're doing mechanical lifting, you are, doing, you are using mechanical uh, lifting machines and tackle as per the DMR regulations um, 18. So the next thing I want to talk about is the principles of rigging and lifting. So in my mind, it shows you, this picture shows you pretty much the principle. In my mind, the principle is I need to take a load and move it. If for whatever reason, something happens and you let go of a rope or in your, when you're doing rope rigging, that load must not move down. It must be stopped at the place where you last left it. 
And the same goes for mechanical equipment. There are some equipment out there that take, for instance, the capstan winch. If a capstan winch does not have a control mechanism that stops the rope from sliding backwards, it is not a lifting machine, but it's a pulling machine. In other words, gravity will stop that machine from moving if you slide it along the ground. So in principle is I don't carry the equipment by myself. If it's more than eight kilogram or then you cannot tie it to yourself. And, and believe me, there has been some issues and some incidences where people actually did this. They tied 20 kilograms of an item or a load to themselves and they climb up the ladder. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. So <laughs> it sounds silly, but that's what they did. And secondly, another principle is you'll see on the right hand side, you need to plan for the lift, lift correctly and make sure that nothing uh, shifts and falls. And in this specific incident, this is coming from an investigation where an actual drip tray fell on somebody and it, there was a fatal incident. So the short of the long is you can the idea of lifting is moving a load and when I let go of my control mechanism, whether it being a button or a rope or a lever or whatever, that load will then stay stationary safely. Right. So that's the biggest principles for for us when we talk about uh, safe rigging and lifting principles. And then obviously the slinging comes afterwards. But the main concept is the load must stay stationary after you've um, let go of the rope or the control mechanism. In the picture, uh, you will see the main differences between rope slinging and mechanical slinging. So most of our rope slinging, you will see there, it's it's got its EN manufacturing date and it's got a COC to which it has been de designed for. It's got a braking strain of roughly about 23 kilonewtons, which gives me about 2,300 kilograms. Um, I'm not going to round it off to the exact number, but you, you get the idea. So 23 kilonewtons is braking strain. Now on the right hand side, you will see a, a piece of lifting equipment, sling specifically, and it's rated to that standard. However, to make it easier for the guys who, who lift it, that sling is rated as a with a working load limit. And it means is if I'm lifting one ton, I use a one ton sling. It's got its own safety factor built into it. So the braking strain for that lifting sling will, will then be seven tons. And that means that it's got a safety factor of seven. So again, to finalize, a lifting sling rated for one ton will break at seven tons. If we go back to the rope slings or the rope equipment slings, it's rated only with a breaking strain of 2,300 kilograms. So we need to find out what is the safe working load or what is the working load limit for that specific sling. In this case, it is 230 kilograms. Please note, this will not be identified on the sling itself. You will only see the braking strain. So an easy way for yourself to, 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 to find the different um, types of equipment, look at the rating on the label. If it says BS or braking strain, you know it's, a, it's used for rope slinging. If it says working load limit, you can use it in mechanical lifting and rigging and if you're still not sure it is a legal requirement that you have the standard on the actual device so it or the it, lifting equipment or lifting tackle so then you can go back to that and our friend google will tell you the answer all right so i think we can talk a little bit about this. Uh, the next slide. You will you will see that. Um, the, 
my main thing I want to discuss is is competence. So there's there's a whole lot of legal definitions and and whatever. But in in order for you to make sure that the company and the person is competent to do either rope bringing or mechanical lifting, you need to know that the person who is doing the work has got number one, the correct knowledge, number two, the correct training, and number three, you must have experience. So that is critical in deciding if I want to employ somebody, employ somebody or not. The other two factors is, as per the uh, construction regulations, a competent person needs to have some sort of OSH Act awareness. In other words, a little bit of legal liability along with that. And then the next thing that's quite interesting, in 2006, I think, they had a the British government or the health and safety executive, uh, they did a study on what is competence. And they found an interesting thing is that a person's attitude will affect his competence. Um, it's, it's quite tricky to do that. How do you manage a person's attitude while he's doing work? And one of the clear things for me is, does that person or entity know what is expected of him or her? And therefore, you can you can help him, you can help assist his attitude. And if it's a positive attitude, then you will have a positive outcome. And on construction sites with repetitive work, it's a little bit tricky to manage. But if you manage to get that right as a manager or a safety officer, it's partly your job to assist with ensuring that the correct work environment, i.e. attitude, is also then encouraged so that the person is engaged while he's doing the work, especially with rigging. If you're not engaged, you are going to make mistakes and then that will be a source for a major accident. Another thing that helps a little bit with attitude is also the buddy system. Um, you've heard me talk about it in our previous workshop. So the buddy system helps me a little bit as well, because then the, the person who's doing the work can ask his friend, listen, quick, can you quickly just check my rigging before we do the pre-lift? Is, is there something that I'm missing? Check my harness. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? So that that, that dialogue is constantly in place. And then that makes it the work, um, what's the right way? Yeah, you, in, you are engaged, you're enjoying the work. Um, and at the end of the day, there's that satisfaction that today I've done something. And and it's not a pie in the sky. I think it's, it is achievable. And I think it's something that we as an industry really need to strive for and make sure that, that, that we do hit that target. So just to go back to this slide, you will see those things then that are just a quick recap of what we've just talked about. So knowledge, training, experience, OSH Act awareness, and know what is expected of me. And then at the top, you'll see their competence. And it will really help a lot if you can manage your teams in such a way that the support is there, the risk assessments are easy and concise, and the support on how to complete them and the Q QMS system behind that is also easy to implement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so I think that's enough said about that. But if you can get this right, trust me, your team will be one of the best. Huh. As part of your test question, um, and just a reminder, we will post that test diagram again during our break, or just at the end of our break just to make sure that you can quickly draw it down. But I need to explain the concept of a mechanical advantage system. So in this system, you will see I've got a load of 240 kilograms. Um, typically in the telecoms industry, what they want is they want to, if they can pre-rig everything, then 
they have to do only one lift instead of two lifts. So we are using mechanical uh, lifting here so that everything inside this picture, the rope, those, it's all rated to a specific working load limit and it's a mechanical lifting tackle that they use. So the load that I'm lifting is 240 kilograms, but the actual lifting machine is only pulling 120 kilograms. So, so how does that work? So let's start from the lifting machine side and we work upwards and you'll see it goes around the pulley. So remember the tension in the rope is now still 120 kilograms. So the tension goes up, it goes through the pulley and it starts going up. <laughs> My apologies. Right, <laughs> let's start again. So don't click the mouse button while you're on the picture because it goes to the next slide. Um, so starts with 120, goes through a pulley and it turns around. So the tension in the rope doesn't matter where you are in this specific system, the tension will always be 120 kilograms. So the tension goes through the pulley, comes down to the snatch block by the weight and it comes back up again. So you'll see there's 120 kilograms on each side. So that's basically being suspended by two ropes. So in total, I've got 120 plus 120 gives me 240. And that's that's pretty much it. So when a rope goes through um, and, it's, and it needs to be almost zero degrees, so the rope must not go through an angle, it must be up and down. So the thing that we also need to remember when we are doing mechanical lifting, our final load on my anchor point needs to be calculated as well. So I take again the tension in the rope is 120 kilograms and then my first snatch block, that hook of the snatch block will load the structure by 240 kilograms. Then the tension in the rope goes further on, goes to the bottom snatch block and it comes in again. And remember that's 120 kilograms. So it goes to my second secondary anchor point. So in total, I've got 360 kilograms on my anchor system. Now the load only weighs 240. So be careful of mechanical advantage systems. It does add additional load However, if we just had one pulley up there and just a normal change of direction, then that load would have been um, 480 kilograms. So you do score a little bit by having this mechanical advantage system. So I hope you guys understand this. Uh, it's pretty simple. And I think the trick here is to remember the tension in the rope stays the same. And whenever there's a change in direction, uh, a 180 degree change or 360 degree change, or depending on you want to talk about it, that load uh, will then be double the tension in the rope. Um, yeah, so this is also explained in the training venue and we give the guys additional time uh, on how to calculate pulley systems. We go back to basics, but the principle here for this exercise as well as for yourself to win a helmet. Remember the tension in the rope goes, stays the same unless there's some sort of a rope grab or whatever on it. All right, so I think we've been now busy with for 21 minutes. So what we want to do is we want a quick break quickly and then we meet back after five minutes. Uh, I recommend you drink some coffee or whatever. I think I'm going to make myself a cup as well. So I will quickly share the. Um, we've got a nice slideshow to share.
Right, huh. welcome back. Uh, I think I just want to, that nice song that we had in place, it messed my system around a little bit. So please uh, give me some grace. Uh, let me just go back. Right, so just to, as a recap quickly, remember the mechanical advantage systems, whenever the rope goes, the tension in the rope stays the same around the pulley, but it doubles at the hook or the carabiner of that specific pulley. Huh. Right, so a lifting plan. What is a lifting plan? A lifting plan is to make sure that you can decide on how you're going to lift the load, how you're going to move it, where is it going to be placed, what are the risks around it. So in short, the, the industry calls a lifting risk assessment procedures and SOPs, they call it a lifting plan. So you will see there is a lot of stuff on there um, and maybe we can quickly discuss it. Uh, I just want to show you the picture again. You can see on, on the actual picture of what we've got there, there's a couple of things that, that you need to know. <clears throat> Obviously the load, the verified weight of the load, uh, the verified anchor load, but keep in mind, there's an additional tagline forces, so that top load won't necessarily always be 500 kilograms. So now we start to think, wait a minute, there's some extra stuff that's that, that, that are involved here. So I think we can quickly discuss it amongst ourselves. Uh, this will be in the, the actual procedure that we share with you. So there's a, there's a myriad, there's a lot of different things that can add to my to my lift to make it a little bit more complicated, and we can quickly discuss it uh, face to face. Right. So so in in short, again, a lifting plan is to make sure that I look at my lift holistically, and I can decide. What other influences are there? <clears throat> what do I need to make sure of that that I do have the right information for? So at the top again is competence and experience. Uh, we'll, we'll have a look at the actual load itself. How much does it weigh? Did we confirm it? And what is the height of the load? Because the height of the load will determine how high my anchor points need to be because if my uh, my my height of the load is too high then i can't lift the load in place and then it will be some chinese trick which suck trying to freaking lift the load and then that's also going to be not a good idea and then for me the the, the biggest um this well one of the two biggest ones the first first one for me is what is my working load limit of my anchor point on the tower so my top anchor point there where I actually anchor my my top pulley or my top sling or even in some cases the lifting machine what is the working load limit of that specific point somebody needs to approve it so the reason for a lifting plan in part is to make sure that I've got all the different facts, factors that influence that working load limit that I've got it in place. What is my angle of my tagline? How much forces does my tagline put onto it? What is my load? What is the weight of the lifting tackle? Uh, is there a mechanical advantage system? Does it double? What kind of lifting machine do I do I use? So, so at the end of the day, when I'm using any kind of lifting equipment, whether it be mechanical or rope, I need to make sure that my anchor point is safe to use. With rope rigging, it's a little bit easier because we limit the load to 100 kilograms. So the owner of the structure 
decides on, okay, he wants to have a antenna in this place or a load must be put here and he does his calculation. And as part of it, as your work permit, there should be a notice that says, listen, my working load limit for this anchor that you've indicated will be 500 kilograms or two tons or, or whatever. And it needs to be signed off by a competent person. So it's the owner of the structure's uh, responsibility to make sure that he gives the permission or the work permit that allows for lifting to take place. And the lifting plan explains to the owner of the building, what am I going to do? What is involved? What machinery? What is the different angles and loads? Uh, then he can decide, uh oh, with this specific structure, I can only allow you to put the anchor point here and the direction of pull can only be on one of the legs, not more than 15 degrees uh, past vertical. So that is, in my mind, the purpose of the, the lifting plan. You will also have to make sure that you can, you can check what is the working load limit of your lifting machine and your lifting tackle. And what's very important is that, that you then use that equipment inside your lifting plan as per the manufacturer specification. And I think that's the trick that we have to remember is everything that we use must have a rating. It must have some sort of a certificate of conformance, uh, either per the, the design or per item uh, like a specific lifting machine will, will then have. The problem is if we don't have this, if we don't have that working load limit calculated in a rational and specific way, we will not be able to predict the top working load limit of my tower or my machine or my slings. So it everything goes pear shaped. And you'll see now there's a there's a whole church load of things that, that needs to be part of that specific lifting plan. So what we do in the training, we train the guys specifically on, on a specific format. What does that lifting plan look like? And we help them to make sure that they then gather that information in a logical format so that your engineer or owner of the structure uh, or a competent person can then approve that specific loading and all the directions of pull and the mechanism and so it's basically a, a method statement, risk assessment, everything combined to make sure that the lifting will be done safely and that my structure won't fail. And I think that's the biggest thing because when you go to mechanical lifting, the devices you use, they have the capability of actually uh, causing structure failure. So we have to be really careful with that. So if we can go back to this to the slideshow. All right, so you'll see there's a, there's a whole church load of things um, and what, what we've basically discussed. One of the next things is wind loading. So wind loading is important because of the size of the item we've got, the surface area, what type of shape it is. Um, tagline loading, you'll be surprised at how much force you need to put in a tagline to keep the load away from the structure at x meters, three, one meter or whatever. Freeboard is important and for our, for a proper risk assessment, you need to be able to, to tell the client or the owner, what is my lo load pathway? In other words, am I going to lift it from a flatbed and then move it to a temporary point? Then from there on, I'm going to start my lifting so that you can have a proper risk assessment in the pathway that your load is going to move. Is there anything that's highly sensitive? Is there a way to make sure that I have proper exclusion zones in place? It's not really part of this discussion, but you can see the, the crane, the ground stability, a lot of cranes fail 
or crane incidences occurred because of ground stability where they didn't confirm or make sure that the ground pressure can actually ho hold the, the crane in place while the load is lifted. Another thing for me that's important is the value of a load. Um, and I'm not talking about the, the peop a person's value. That's not, you can't calculate that. That's um, incalculable. <laughs> but the the load value is important. It it will need because there's a specific way that you're gonna rig it. Is it and that will give you an idea of how comprehensive your lifting plan is. So if you've got a proper exclusion zone and if the load falls, it will fall on the ground, nothing happens. Fine. But the principle is I'm lifting a $10 million load or why did I say dollar? Rand load. And then if you make a mistake, then damage to property will be serious. It will be, the, it will be, I, I think you guys can all agree with me in the, in the consequences of that. So I'm not saying you don't have to do a proper lifting plan when the value of the load is 50, 50 rand. But the principle is you need to put more effort in the more risks there are. And the value of the load increased that actual risk. The type uh, and the combined weight of the tackle that you are using, all the equipment. In other words, all your slings and your your wire ropes or your chains or your bridle slings or the spreader beams themselves you need to be able to make sure that that weight is also part of your final working load limit calculation and then lastly we've got a um, type of rigging is it simple or is it is it complex so to show you a nice diagram of what lifting plans should look like. This is a very basic one, and I think it's only the first page, but you get the idea of being able to present the lifting plan in such a way that it's number one, easy to compile, and number two, so that the client or the owner can understand what will the loads be on that specific system and how you intend to lift it. Uh, you can also check, are you slinging the load the correct way? Maybe this load is a bit more fragile and that is not the correct anchor point. And he will come back to you and say, listen, I, that is not the correct point. If you're lucky, there's a lifting point already on there then it's easy. And, and a lot of the big industrial lifting is like that. The guys have, have a lot of foresight and they put um, eye nuts on it or bad eyes or whatever so you can just click a bridle sling and you can quickly equalize it um, with a turn screw and then the load will be stable and you can lift it up but in most cases especially with a with a rope rigging sometimes it's not that clear so there needs to be specific ways on how you're going to sling that load uh, and the way you sling it will also determine your freeboard uh, so they even, you can see even hand signals, there's what kind of communication, there's a team composition, there's admin requirements that needs to be in place, the description of the lift. Is it only a lift? In other words, do you install a new item or is it a lift and lower exercise where you need to take the old item off and bring up a new one? So, so that will that'll influence your lift. And like I said, this is only the first page. There, there is some more additional requirements in terms of tag lines and angles and load and wind loading that that will add to your system um, that, that we train the guys in, in the course itself. So after you've developed your lifting plane and the client approved it as part of your work permit, then you need to make sure that that lifting plane is communicated. In other words, it's it's not really optional. A lot of people, they say, no, the, the rigger knows what he's doing. He's done it a lot. So, but every lift is a little bit different. So it's important that we do communicate that specific lifting plan with my team. 
So number one, they know what is expected of them. It creates that positive attitude that we've talked that we've discussed in the beginning. Um, if they've got any questions, this is the time for asking questions, or maybe they've got suggestions. And then if something goes really pear shaped, we need to make sure that if something can go pear shaped, that we discuss it in the beginning. So as part of the things that, that you'll see, common mistakes that the guys do is they tie a pulley at the top and there are three or four guys in just lifting it up. So there's a couple of major mistakes in my mind in, in what's going on with it, pulling the tower sideways. Number one, the tower is not designed to take forces um, in that specific direction with that antenna. It's only designed for compression forces and in a little bit of wind loading or a lot of wind loading, depending on the actual force uh, of the wind. A sec uh, another principle at the bottom you'll see there, we, we don't typically like to ta put the tagline on, on the bottom of an item, especially if it's fragile. If it's not fragile, then we do that because that'll, that'll help me a lot. But what it does do is you will see there, it, it creates opposing forces. So I'm pulling 25 kilograms here and Saki is pulling 50, but my weight is 50 and and now I've got a combined load of 75 and then that doubles at the top. So it's we need to be careful in the angle of our of our taglines, especially when we start to use a controlling mechanism like a, a descender or something to control that then it's, it will easily uh, increase the load on your final top anchor a lot if, if your tagline angle and connection point is not specific and not in the correct place. So yeah, um, I think that covers the, the, the lifting plan and we've seen pictures on the internet of tower failures. Um, in America, there's a lot of, of lifting and rigging failures. Um, and in my mind, it's because of not doing a proper lifting plan, not using the right equipment, ropes cutting over sharp edges, stuff like that. So the lifting plan is not optional. It needs to be done. And remember, the final working load limit needs to be approved by a competent person, client appointed or a engineer to make sure that that tower will then be able to resist the forces. Ha, right, so here's the next interesting topic, inspections. So, I think if we can maybe discuss it amongst ourselves quickly and, and just, um, have a face-to-face -face talk on exactly why or what is what is the the issue sometimes. So, because we are involved in both industries, we're involved with the the rope rigging industry that uses rope equipment and the mechanical lifting industry that uses mechanical equipment. Uh, we work on a lot of sites that, uh, for instance, the mining industry they require that specific inspection criteria. So the principle is, and I'm saying principle because I don't like rules because rules can change. The principle is that we need to split the two different equipments. One is rope equipment. It's got specific inspection criteria, manufacturer criteria, and a person who is trained in that inspection process and the actual standards can then inspect that uh, rope rigging equipment. If it's mechanical lifting equipment, it's more of a, uh, how can I put this, uh, stable ground or something that we are more used to. In other words, there's a LMI or lifting machine inspector uh, he's then registered with a lifting machine entity and then he's also lifted but with the Engineering Council of South Africa for a specific lifting uh, machinery. 
type. So for instance, you will get a LMI that's registered to inspect suspended platforms. So if it's not registered, it cannot inspect that suspended platform. Uh, there's lifting um, man cages, for instance. So the, the principle is that you can inspect an item if you have knowledge, experience and training in that specific item. So if we want to inspect rope access equipment or rope lifting equipment, we need to make sure that the person who's inspecting that has been trained in the operation of that rope equipment. So a typical LMI will not have been trained in that specific rope lifting techniques because it's mainly up to 100 kilograms. A normal LMI is 100 kilograms in their minds is, is, I don't know, it, it's light. So the principle is please split them, make sure that you've got in both cases, you've got training records for, from your inspector that proves he can inspect a specific item. And one of the items that's required is he needs to do a function check. Um, there's a specific requirement in, in the lifting industry for an LMI as per driven machinery regulations, and it's a specific requirement in terms of how do you do a function check on a pulley or a descending device or a rope grab, where an LMI would not have been trained in that. Um, another big difference in our side is that for rope equipment or harnesses specifically, the harness has got a COC on the design of the harness. In other words, if it says EN361, that means it's got a four that is rating. So that specific COC that you will get is for the type of design and to prove that they've seen the design through to the correct inspection authority. Um, what we do is from our side, we prefer to use EN standards because all EN standards are have an additional control that's got CE marking on it as well, which determines the manufacturing conditions on your manufacturing side. And they've got specific tests for that. Now you've got an additional body that comes in as a, as a European norm and make sure then that you've got the right testing done. And in the background, they will also check what is your QMS system that you've got in place to make sure that this personal protective equipment class three has the right QMS system involved to make sure that your product that you give is safe for use and fit for purpose. And, and for to make, make it clear, the class three rating is a life-saving item. So it's not standard PPE. If you don't wear a harness and you fall, you're dead. If your harness breaks and you fall, you're dead. So harnesses has got a specific way of inspection and we need to make sure that our clients and our client representatives and in the client specifications, we need to be clear on how to inspect rope equipment and rope um, and per personal protective equipment to use that height. Then we've got our lifting machine that is quite clear that driven from driven machining regulations that you need to make sure that as a supplier, you need to have a COC for that specific lifting machine before you can resell it. Even though it's got its own COC coming back from, from the European Union with the CE mark, everything is on there. We are required to make sure that we do a full function test and a full inspection of the um, lifting machine and all its components and take it through its entire range of motion uh, by, by an LMI before we can resell it. And then that certificate then is valid for one year and after one year, it needs to be inspected again. And you can have a look at the driven machining regulations where it talks about tackle that needs to be inspected three or six monthly. Um, the same goes for PPE. 
that the closest specification we have for the time frame of inspection of PPE is from the uh, ISO standards and they recommend six months, but from previous experience we know that items need to be inspected at least every three months. But again, remember that does not exclude hazardous environments. If I'm a welder or a hot metal worker, my inspection period needs to be smaller, daily or weekly. Some of our sites require monthly inspections, which I'm also happy with. Um, we need just need to make sure that the person who's inspecting it is competent, and then he will know the right references that he's been trained in to make sure that that actual lifting machine or equipment or tackle has been in inspected correctly and has got it the right specification or design criteria around it. Right, so just to, uh, we will now have a, I'm going to quickly have you a look, uh, give you an idea on the training that's required for doing rope rigging and mechanical lifting and I think it's easier just to explain it with a with a slideshow or a slide presentation. Thank you for my producer who's doing such a good job in in assisting me with the slideshow. So well done. So the training requirement. I've got a a rope rigging course where we certify persons to use to lift a load of 100 kilograms. Remember, that's not my total load. That's the load of the of the actual weight itself. So there's a lot of different factors involved, and we put controls and measures in place to make sure that that we don't exceed a specific load from the manufacturer. So the 100 kilograms is, with all extra additional controls in place we limit this specific course to 100 kilograms. The moment you go above 100 kilograms, it's very difficult to lift equipment safely inside the manufacturer's specs. So we say that if we go more, more than 100 kilograms, we need to do the mechanical rigging course where we use a machine and not person strength to, to lift the load. Uh, typically, we limit it to a 500 kilogram load. That's the loads we we have available. Um, it can be more if the if the client has a venue with where they've got an additional load that, that we can um, use as a a competence test, for instance. We are we have registered the two um, unit standards with Mercieta, uh, and we've got trainers, assessors, and moderators. And the unit standard for rope rigging is perform basic rigging procedures. And we in included a little bit of rope axis lifting and lowering methods as part of that course so that it's, it's, it's rigging. In other words, it's a little bit of lifting and but we certified with Mercieta and the value of that course is to 2,814 Rand. There are some prerequisites uh, but you will get that all all that information once you want to uh, do a formal inquiry on the booking itself, and then a me mechanical uh, rigging course. Like I said, typically 500 kilogram maximum. It uses a specific unit standard, and we've registered that with Mercita, and it's valued at 3,200 rand. So there, there are. That's the competence. Um, Please note that it will give you about 80% of your experience. You need a little bit of a of a monitoring afterwards in the field. So it's not a rubber stamp exercise. We do do a practical assessment and make sure that the lifting is done correctly in a, the correct environment. So, but with all training, there is a little bit of experience that needs to be in place. From, from your side, from the client side, that that needs to be managed. And then lastly, I want to leave you with, with three um, thoughts that we have to have in place. Um, 
we've discussed this previously. Uh, this is called the just culture duty. So this just culture comes from the aviation and the nursing industry where employees don't have enough time to do to stop and do a proper risk assessment. They need to do continuous risk assessments as they do the work. Um, you can imagine with a air traffic controller, if something goes pear shape, he needs to immediately make it a, a decision and he needs to be able to justify that decision that they that is made. The first duty, and, and this goes for everybody, it doesn't matter what you are doing, if you are freaking washing toilets or lifting 2000 ton loads, it's the same. That I have a duty not to expose myself and others to harm. And that's the basic principle of any occupational health and safety. It's the employer and the employee have a duty not to expose himself or others to harm. The second duty that you have is you have a duty to reach an outcome. In other words, the outcome is go home safely, but that's only the safety outcome. It's got a production outcome as well, where items need to be finished and installed as per the correct quality requirements. So that's the whole point of doing this thing. If you are an aircraft controller, you want to freaking land the aircraft and make sure that it's safe. And then the second one, two minutes later, it can also come and land. So the outcome is important, but it still needs to adhere to the first rule of not to expose yourself to, and others to harm. And then lastly, I have a duty to follow procedures. Typically, what the guys will do is they will move this procedure to the top and says follow procedure. But what that implies is it, it says that you are forcing the employee to follow procedures blindly and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that they follow the procedure with keeping the first two duties in mind. That if they see that this, this something's going to come up that's going to be unsafe, then they need to stop and communicate that and find out. Or if it's an emergency situation, they need to be able to make a call on that specific time, what, what to do. So it's following procedures, but with an open mind, with a rational mind, with an engaged mind, with the right attitude. And then as an employer, you will then have a safe work environment that will install quality products. So in short, three, three things to remember. Do not expose yourself or others to harm reach an outcome and follow procedures. And that's pretty much the end of, of my um, discussion here. Um, it's quite interesting that if you if you look at the picture, technically <laughs> my goat is the lifting machine and the little chimp on top of him is the load because <laughs> he's transporting the load although he's doing it a bit dodging me. So I think we'll we'll go from now um, to the, the next break. Yeah, I think uh, my producer agrees with me. You can formulate your questions um, as you want. Please post it and then uh, my producer and I will quickly work through that. And again, we'll have about five minutes for for that specific discussion. And Please remember your answers to the um, question on the rigging. So let me go back to the original one. And right, I'll, I'll leave this in place. Um, Yeah, um, please put your answers there and we'll see each other in, in five minutes. And specifically answering uh, questions and answers, yeah.
great. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I think now is a is my favorite time um, of a workshop or a masterclass, so we can get some questions and answers. Uh, just a reminder: uh, your you've got until the end of the presentation for your answer to the query question, and then the person who got the right answer will be posted on Facebook. Um, the it's a, the gravity group Facebook. So I'm going to scroll down the questions. Uh, we've had quite a number of questions and answers. So we've got in total about 123 questions and we've published 14 of those, which we think is quite applicable. Um, so let me just OK, so I'll, I'll start from the top. <laughs> All right, so, so the one of the questions is, can we do lifting by using a car or a vehicle? So <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, you will even if you have a winch on the bucky, it is not a lifting machine. It is a pulling machine. Um, secondly, there's a lot of additional risks involved there. Um, and even if you use the vehicle without a lift, the vehicle is not rated as a lifting machine. It doesn't have it's the C, uh, COC as a lifting machines. So when we do any kind of mechanical lifting, we need to make sure that we follow the driven machinery regulations. Uh, and a bucky doesn't fall under driven machinery regulations. So the short answer is no. Our second question. How many people are required to rig a 25 kilogram object on site? So this is a long and a short answer. Um, the short answer is we train our people when we do um, standard full edge training on how to lift tools uh, using a one to one system uh, up, up to 20 kilograms. So that's just lifting your own tools and stuff to do the work. It's not lifting a device, but Technically, it can be seen as as lifting because you are lifting some sort of an item. If you are doing rope rigging and lifting, in other words, this is a specific item that you need to install permanently or temporary on site. Then the client will determine the amount of persons, but typically in my mind, it will be at least. Two. And then if you add your tagline person, it can be three. So one person to install the load at the top, one person to rig it, and that same person can also control the lifting machine or the top person can control it. Sometimes the client requires an additional one. Uh, I know specifically for ESCOM, in, for example, they've got a specific cont uh, control mechanism where they require the supervisor to be in direct supervision. In other words, he needs to stand on the side and specifically look at what's happening. The whole process must be under direct supervision. Uh, so that's specifically for the client. So that your answer is two or three, depending on the client requirements. Um, the next question we have is. <laughs> All right, so the next question we have is OK, fine. Now we can't use a car, so what can we use? So. Again, depending on the on the industry, uh, I assume this question is a is a telecoms industry. So if you don't use the car, the answer is use a lifting machine if the load is more than 100 kilograms. So specifically for the telecoms um, industry, there's for the for the height that's involved. Uh, we have two specific lifting machines. The one is a, a capstan 
voiced, which is a it's basically a hoist that's got a drum that spools the rope on it. It's got three turns. I think you saw it in our five minute video in the previous break. So it doesn't matter. The, the lifting height is not dependent on the size of the drum because the rope can continuously spool over that and the rope moves through that lifting machine. That is the one option or you can go standard or the typical go to for all uh, high lifting. Uh, mechanical lifting is a, a they call it the, the correct name is a wire rope lever hoist or in short a turfer. So basically that you use a turfer for that. But remember it's still governed as lifting machines. So we need to follow the lifting machines requirements that it needs to be properly inspected uh, for the full range of motion by an LMI once a year and then three and six months uh, inspections must also be done by a competent or a qualified person. All right, so hopefully that core question is, is now uh, settled. So the short answer is lifting machine that's properly controlled. I've got a question on competency. Um, the question reads, uh, competency, just a question on rigging for construction sites. Is it true that the best practice to have a qualified rigger for loads over five tons and just a banksman's for load lower than five tons? So <laughs> this is where it becomes tricky. So if we go back to our requirements and we look at the training required by the operator, so the five ton thing is a bit of a misnomer in my mind. At the, at the end of the day, a competent qualified rigger must be involved with all lifting machines. Now, I think this question is a little bit loaded it, in terms of the, the rigger is either person who slings the load and the crane then lifts the load up or is he the actual person who controls the lifting machine? So the answer is then easy when it comes to lifting machine because you need a competent mach lifting machine operator being whatever class it is. Um, in terms of a rigger to sling a load, Again, the, the, the rigger must be competent in slinging the load. So you have to be careful on that and make sure that you have had the right training to be able to sling and rig that load. You're not going to lift it, you're just going to ring it, you're going to sling it. So a banksman in my mind is a guy waving a flag. So at the end, make sure that it is a competent person who rigs it and he's got the right training registered with Mercieta to be able to rig and sling loads. Um, typically, they they would then load. I think they 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 limit with the first one. They limit it to, to two tons, and then from further additional tons as per experience. And obviously, then if you do a critical lift, like at Medupe, we did a uh, we raised a bridge that was. 250 tons, I think, and we used 400 ton uh, hydraulic jacks, cable jacks. So that's then a special lift. So it, it then requires a special lifting plan and a special procedure. So competency with the correct lifting plan approved by the client with the correct risk assessments, then that's the way that to properly go about rigging loads. Um, ha, this is a good question. So the question we've got now is, will an anchor point um, selected for mechanical lifting have a different pull test certificate rating uh, than normal rope reading anchor point? So this is where it becomes tricky. The specific 
device being an anchor uh, iPad or anchor bolt will have its own rating and its own specifications. What's important is to make sure that you've got an engineering approval for the entire structure. So when we're doing mechanical lifting, it's not just for the anchor point itself. The anchor point will have its own rating as if buying it from a proper uh, lifting machine and equipment supplier with the COC on that, uh, whether it being a sling or hardware, but the working load limit where I fix those items to and the way that I fix them to it must be approved by a competent person or an engineer. So it's, it's not really the same as, as normal rope rigging items. Uh, it won't have a, a, a pull test. It is one of the um, items uh, my, my wife used to do a lot of horse riding and she said that if you do horse riding, you, you need to have a lot of arrows in your quiver so that if the horse doesn't respond to a certain thing, then you need to pull another arrow out and then start doing something different. So the LMI has got a lot of quivers in his test um, bag that he can use, and one of them is to, to do it uh, preload uh, pre on, on that item, but it's not recommendable, especially for towers and, and structures, because if you overload that, tower or structure, it comes down, and I can guarantee you that LMI won't be happy with that. So approval for mechanical um, lifting anchor points needs to be done with a proper lifting plan and a competent person. Great, I hope that makes sense. Hmm, I've got a a tricky question that, that comes up. So the question is, what is the minimum training requirement for a person who, um, for a person to have to register as a mechanical rigger as per the DMR? So I think this is the one that I'm not totally sure of. I'll have to do some more research on that. Um, and what I can say is I know there's there's a there's a, a tricky thing with the old red seal uh, that needed to be achieved uh, to become a proper rigger. So in place of that, you've got the Mercia now that governs the training requirements. So in short, he must have a as a competent person. He needs to have SACWA training and then with knowledge and experience as per the type of load um, and the lifting situation and all those things combined. The, so that's for the rigor itself. The DMR is very specific when it comes to the mechanical machine that you are using. So the training that you will receive is as per specific lifting machine. Now, remember, that can be a chain chain block, a lever hoist, a coffin hoist, a uh, crane, um, man baskets. So the DMR's got specific licenses that they issue for the uh, mechanical lifting machine operator. But for the rigger, as far as I know, um, I know I'm not sure that the, the red seal is in place anymore. The, the only reference that I do have now is the Mercieta qualifications uh, where you need to be registered with a specific unit standard as a rigger. Uh, and please note a rigger in my mind is somebody that slings a load. Um, and then the training then will determine if you can actually use a specific lifting machine after you've done the slinging of that load. I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure who was, was asking it. Um, sure, there's a lot of questions. There's 18 more to go. I'm going to try and filter it a little bit. My producer has already filtered a lot of the questions, so he's re read through about 88 already. So, um, 
We've got a question from uh, Annalisa. Can we trust the shackles, eyeballs, and other lifting equipment that are sold at the hardware stores? What do we need to look for out for to ensure the quality of equipment? Ah, so that's a good question. Um, it's got a simple answer. So the DMR is very specific in saying that all lifting tackle must be manufactured as per a specific standard. So number one, there needs to be a certain EN or a SAB standard on that lifting tackle that you intend to buy. Um, it also needs to be clearly marked on what is the working load limit of that specific item. And then lastly, you need to have a certificate of conformance. So the driven machinery requires every single item to have a certificate of conformance. So if your supplier can give you the standard that has been manufactured to, it can give you the working load limit that's been clearly indicated, and it can also give you a COC um, that's filled or by the proper authorities or by a competent person, then it might be safe to use. I know that you need to have a look at the DMR 18 requirements. There's one or two other um, requirements for lifting tackle um, that, that is in there, but those are my three main items that I, that I know of my head. It must be rated for a specific standard. It must be a working load limit onto it. And then there must be a COC that accompany, accompanies that specific item. And I know most hardware shops won't be able to give you that. Um, so in rigging and lifting, uh, we don't have a backup, especially for mechanical equipment. So we work on safety factors. So if you buy an item that does not have a safety factor that you can prove, and you can't prove that it's been manufactured properly for the through the proper QMS system, then you can't use it because the risk is simply too big. You can't say that that item is going to hold if it doesn't have those three um, control mechanisms at least. So yeah, in short, Lisa, you can't trust the shackles unless you have it. Annalisa. Um, the next question is a is a question that we've already discovered discussed in our slideshow. It is um, from Shakib, and he asks, is, is wind having an effect on the lifting? And in, and in short, the answer is yes. Uh, the main factor will be then that, that it will load your tagline. So because your tagline needs to keep the item in place and the lift will then try to, the wind will then try to move that load. Additionally, if it comes from a different direction, that load then will have an effect on the top of the tower where your anchor point is. So wind load is definitely something you need to think about and it must be on your lifting plan and depending on the surface area and the expected wind load that you expect for that specific area. There's, there's engineering charts that are available. Every country has got their own maximum uh, wind load that they uh, predict can happen and then you can work from there and you can decide your what is your safe um, wind speed that you can do your lifting. Uh, so that's the short answer. Uh, Shakib, I hope, you, I hope you, it makes sense to you. Um, Iwin asks, what's the lifespan of fall array systems? The go-to go item is the manufacturer's requirements. Typically, the items that, that we selling and EN products have got a between a, a, mostly a 10 year lifespan. If you look at it, nice, look after it nicely and you put it in a cupboard and you play music to it at night and it's ideal conditions, 10 years later, bye bye harness. All right. Um, I know ropes are 15 years, but remember the background in terms of what have you used it for and did it receive it, its required inspections every three or six months? Uh, 
Uh, right. The next one is a is a bit tricky one. Uh, I must admit I haven't been involved in uh, rigging cranes. So the question from Johannes is what appointment must be done regarding the crew that assembles and dismantles the crane? So Johannes, I'm not sure. Um, I think it's as per the manufacturer's requirements and it also depends on what you're doing. If you are using a specific lifting machine to pre-rig that, so I know a lot of the cranes have a built-in machine and they use their actual crane drum to pull up the boom, uh, then you are lifting a lifting machine. So you will be appointed then as a lifting machine operator and then riggers um, whoever does the slinging and rigging for that. But at the end of the day, your manufacturer and your client will then give you those specifications. So in short, if you are using a lifting machine, then you are a lifting machine operator. But I think it then um, it's either then going to be under the section A2I, um, under the OSH Act, or it will be a specific appointment on um, the driven machining regulations. And if it's a very complex site, then you will appoint your uh, general machining regulations 2.1. He's in charge of all plant moving equipment, lifting machinery on a site. So then your GMR 2.1 will give you the correct information regarding the actual appointment of your crew for that specific site. So the short answer is via the grapevine. GMR 2.1 appointee will then assist you with that and make sure then that if it's a lifting machine, then you are a lifting machine operator with a specific license. Um, okay. We're almost running out of time, so I just want to quickly filter through some, some stuff. OK, uh, this is also, I think, in the telecoms industry. What machine can I use to lift over 120 kilograms with? Uh, so in short, we train 100 kilograms. And if you for rope rigging, uh, anything above that, you use a um, lifting machine being specifically the capstan winch or a lever hoist, depending on the height that you want to go. There's a question on what is the competency of a lifting tackle inspector. So the competency, if I remember correctly, pardon me for closing my eyes, it's my thinking break, thinking face that I'm putting on. Um, you've got a LTI, lifting tackle inspector. So there's a specific course for lifting, lifting tackle inspector and he then works under the, the LMI and the LMI works then under the, the lifting machine entity and you have to be registered for that. Um, OK. So we've got a question with the capstan winch uh, and hoist. With a one-to-one -one pulley system, uh, do we not put too much load on the anchor point, especially on a monopole? Is it possible and maybe better to connect the capstan winch to a, to more than one anchor point at the top? So, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that the, that your owner of the structure gives you that working load limit, and depending on that, you can change your rigging and you can share your loads. Uh, additionally, you can actually mount the capstan winch at the top, which will then have a load of only the load itself, plus the small tag line that holds it in place. If you put your lifting machine on the bottom, you double your load, uh, your working load limit of your anchor point. So the short answer is proper lifting plan, client or owner of the structure and competent person to approve that lifting plan. 
Um, and then the last one I've got is how to lift and install safely. <laughs> okay, so what, what, what Ibrahim is asking us, he's saying it's a more specific question on lifting. So what do I do on a tower that's got a lot of different antennas already put onto the, onto the tower itself? And it's, there's antennas in the way and well, it really becomes a tricky lift. Um, you, you have a difficulty finding anchor points, you have a difficulty getting the load past obstructions. Um, in short, every tower has got a specific rating um, in terms of what is it is what is it the capacity of that tower to support the additional items that's placed on the tower <clears throat> so that will then be determined by where the tower is placed this is on a mountain what's the the wind run up um, speed and all sorts of other requirements so that the Abraham, the answer for that question is the owner of the structure again will then need to approve your lifting plan. And then you need to discuss it with this subject matter expert to say this is how you rig it. And typically with a uh, clustered or um, what's the right word? It's those specific structures with a lot of items on it, you need to have a gin pole that either rigs out as an outrigger and the tower is here and your load anchor point is at, at the end. And then an engineer will then have to approve that or a competent person will have to approve that. And then your load will be then lifted past all the obstructions and can be just pulled into position the correct way. So typically with a gin pole, you need to have a lot of freeboard where you can pull the load in without affecting the gin pole itself. So I think that's all the answers that all the questions that we've, we've got. Just as a reminder, the correct or the person who won the pulley system um, question, it will be posted onto Facebook and the first person who answer the question correctly. Um, I think we can give the right answer now. Not yet. OK, so we'll give the right answer on Facebook. Uh, I can tell you, give you a tip. It's not a three to one. And we'll, and, and we'll share the picture as well. So thank you, everybody. I think we had a great time. Thank you for all the questions that come, came in. Um, we've had a lot of good responses. So please watch this space for additional uh, time if there's something really specific that you want to discuss. Uh, additionally, make sure that you uh, join the right courses and have a look at our website if, if you don't remember the pricing. Uh, have a look at the Gravity Gear website and uh, where they've got a lot of it's a nice interactive website. And in closing from my side, thank you for your patience. And also thank you for all the other people that helped me. The, the picture that you saw of that pulley system was done by Donnie. Uh, he's our in-house um, graphic designer slash uh, mathematical expert. So thank you for him. Um, thank you for Barry for your input. Barry Lottering, our MD with a slideshow and Yandre as, as our producer. So it's really a group. Uh, event and, and we all work together as a team to, to present this slideshow to you with a, obviously now with your 10, 15, 20 years experience that goes into a slideshow like this. So thank you everybody and I hope you have a good weekend and enjoy the, the Easter weekend and stay safe.